So it's my pleasure to introduce Pedro Felsenschwab. I've been uh, following Pedro's work since he was an undergraduate at Cornell. So it's not, it's, uh, as you know, it's unusual to have papers published as an undergraduate. Uh, and it's even more unusual to have that work be very influential and still read uh, you know, a decade later as, um, as Pedro's work has been. So um, of course, uh, his career didn't end as an undergrad. He's been doing some very exciting work uh, first as a graduate student at MIT, um, and, uh, and then uh, he was back at Cornell as a postdoc, and he's been at the Univers University of Chicago for uh, five years, is that right? Four years. And uh, so Pedro does work at the border of uh, computer vision, machine learning, and algorithms, and he's going to be talking about that today. Okay. Thanks, Steve. Uh, so uh, I work... Uh, I'm actually very interested in lots of problems within computer vision, uh, AI, and, and algorithms. Uh, but today I'll talk to you about uh, my work on object recognition. Uh, I'll talk about a few different projects. Uh, and, and, and the work is joined with a number of people. Uh, Dan Huttenlocker from Cornell. Uh, Joshua Schwartz was an undergrad at Chicago. Uh, and David McAllister and Deva Ramanan, who were at Toyota Technological Institute. So I, I want to talk to you about uh, this work on object recognition. Uh, there are many different kinds of recognition problems that I'm interested in. So let me just start by describing uh, these different types of problems. So different types of object recognition problems. So this is what object recognition looked like in the 80s. Uh, and I don't mean it as a joke. I mean, it's, you know, this is good work. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but basically, people were interested in recognizing, finding, detecting specific rigid objects. So you can imagine having a 3D model of the object you want to find, of this stapler, not just stapler, this particular stapler. And then you're trying to find a projection of this object in an image. So this problem is largely solved. Uh, and, and this is what object recognition looks like nowadays. So this is, these are pictures from the Pascal challenge, which I'll talk about. Uh, later in my talk, but here the goal is to detect objects like cars, people, cows, tables, bottles. There are 20 different objects that you'd like to find, uh, and, and these are uh, very realistic pictures just downloaded from the web, uh, and the goal is to put a bounding box around each object. So this problem is largely unsolved, uh, but we're working on it. Um, here's another object detection problem, detecting non-rigid objects. So uh, maybe, I don't know if you can recognize me in this picture, but that is me uh, at MIT. Uh, so here, so the goal is to estimate the pose of a human body from a single picture. Um, and we can do that pretty decently. Uh, here's another object detection problem uh, in medical image analysis. Uh, you'd like to detect uh, various kinds of structures, in this case, a uh, MRI of, of a brain, and you'd like to find a corpus callosum, so this is a slice like this through a head. Uh, and uh, the shape that's delineated that was uh, detected automatically uh, by a system I built. Um, and here's another sort of biomedical problem of finding, detecting, segmenting cells in, in microscopes. Uh, so here, um, also a system we built. Uh, so these are very different kinds of uh, recognition problems. And the one thing. Uh, they share uh, that makes them difficult is that you'd like to be able to recognize objects of a class, not a specific object. And, and this class may have objects that uh, vary a lot in what they look like. So in the case of finding cars, you want to find cars of different models, different colors, and you want to find cars, and you might be looking at the car from different viewpoints. So these cars look actually very different from image to image. And you need to somehow model what cars look like of any model viewed from any direction. Uh, and and non-rigid objects, you have a similar problem because uh, a person can be in many poses, and you need to recognize them in any of those poses. So one, a significant problem is how do you encode, how do you somehow uh, model uh, the different ways that an object can look like? And the approach that I'll talk about today is uh, this deformable model approach. And the idea is actually very simple and intuitive to model every object in a class, every instance, as a deformed version of some ideal template. 
Uh, and this lets you uh, talk about you know, very uh, large classes of objects. So for example, if you look at the corpus callosum images here, down here, I think this is a very good example of a problem that begs to be, to be solved using the formable models. You can imagine each of these shapes here, uh, the corpus callosi, as the form versions of some kind of ideal corpus callosum. And this gives a very simple way to represent uh, a variety of objects. And it leads to, to really interesting algorithmic questions and learning questions uh, and, and modeling questions in terms of building statistical models for these things. So let me give you a brief overview of the talk. So uh, the idea is that I'll start by talking about different kinds of algorithms for matching the formable models to images. So first I'll talk about pictorial structure models. Uh, so this is work that I started back when I was an undergrad. Uh, and I'll talk about uh, the formable shape models, uh, both work that I've done in the past and I'm doing right now. Uh, and I'll eventually talk about this Pascal challenge. So this is a specific system we built to compete in this challenge. Uh, so the challenge is to recognize and, and, and localize 20 different object categories in realistic images. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll show you the, the system we built which uses the formable models uh, that were discriminatively trained from partially labeled data to, to solve this problem. Uh, so the whole talk I'll, I'll be talking about the formable models and a lot uh, of what ties these together is not just the fact that they are the formable models but also the algorithmic questions that arise when you think about these different kinds of models. And I won't talk about much, but a lot of my work in object recognition uh, also involves thinking about statistical formulations of these models. So you can think about the problem of detecting an object in an image as, for example, finding the location which is the most probable location for this object in the image. Uh, so a lot of my work in this area is, is also related to statistical models. So I'll start by talking about these pictorial structure models. So Pictorial structures were introduced in the, in the 70s uh, in this really nice paper by Fischler and Alschlager. Uh, and the idea is to model an object by a number of parts arranged in a deformable configuration. So this is a picture from their uh, 73 paper. And so the idea is that you model a face by saying it has a, two eyes, a hair, mouth, nose, and so on. And each of these parts are rigid parts, but the, you model the, the spatial relationships between these parts in terms of pairwise connections that you can think of as springs connecting pairs of parts. And, and one of the key ideas of their paper is to think about the problem of matching one of these models to an image as a global sort of a, an optimization problem. So, and I, I call, I'll call it stretch and fit. So the idea is that you consider moving this, this model on top of an image and stretching it in different ways, trying to find a placement of it which doesn't stretch the springs too much, but also that each part explains the image data underneath it. Uh, and, and so this is a, it's an optimization problem and it turns out to be a very uh, nice way to frame the problem. So just to give you an idea about what this looks like in practice, so the, the model has a number of parts, the model for an object, and the idea is that you, for every part, you have a cost of placing that part somewhere in the image. And so here you have an image of a motorbike and then you have a part which may be the front wheel of the motorbike. And this is illustrating a cost of placing the front wheel at each location of the image. And bright locations are good locations for the wheel. And you can see that there is more than one good location for the wheel because, well, there's a back wheel which looks like it. And so what you'd like to do is to not try to find front wheels on their own, but for example, model the fact that the bike has two wheels and one tends to be in front of the other, and, and combining the match quality maps for each wheel with their spatial relationships to find the optimal location for the object. And you want to do this as, as, a, as a global optimization problem. Question. Yeah? Why is there a large white region on the upper left where there's no wheel? It's just whatever, uh, so there's some way of measuring how much the image looks like the wheel at each location. 
And in this case, I implemented some kind of simple correlation just to generate this picture. And whatever measure I use, which I don't remember exactly, matches well there. So maybe it's just matching the white space inside the wheel? Maybe it's matching the white space inside the wheel, yes. <laughs> That's a better answer. <laughs> uh, but, and, and actually, I don't want to talk now in detail about how you get these maps. I want to talk about how you combine these maps together to get the location of the object. I'm going to treat this as a black box. Uh, and I'm gonna, we can now formulate an algorithmic problem, which, which is defined as follows. Just, so the, the problem is formalized by saying the model is defined in terms of a graph. With the nodes are the parts of the object, and the edges are the connections between parts. And for each part, you have a match quality. So mi of li is the cost of placing part i allocation li. And this is the black box, which I'll assume for now, which is what I showed you in the next slide, in the last slide. And then for every edge in your, in your graph, you have some kind of deformation cost, which measures how much two locations for two connected parts agree with each other. And this is uh, modeled by this deformation cost, di, j, li, lj. And then you'd like to find a configuration for the object. And a configuration specifies a location for each of the parts. And you want the configuration which minimizes a cost function, which basically is summing up the individual match costs with the deformation costs. So the match costs look at the image, and the deformation costs basically measure how much the two locations agree without looking at the image at all. And so now the problem is just how do you uh, minimize this, this cost function, which we often, we, it's called E because we call it an energy function for various reasons, but it's not important. So this is not an easy problem. Uh, obviously, uh, there is an exponential number of possible configurations to consider. If you have n parts, k, k, k loc so we'll assume that we have n parts and k locations that you could place each part in. So k could be, for example, the number of pixels in an image. So in that case, you have k to the n configurations, and you'd like to find the best one. And it turns out that, uh, that this problem is NP hard, but we can handle it very well in some special cases, some important special cases. So the first assumption I'm going to make is that the graph uh, that defines the model is a tree. And that by itself leads to a polynomial time algorithm. So we can use dynamic programming over the tree structure of the graph to get an algorithm that is linear in the number of parts and quadratic in the number of locations of each part. Now, that's great, but it's still quite slow, because if the locations are the number of pixels, uh, we'd still be here. Uh, I would never have finished my undergrad, I guess. Uh, so, but it turns out that there's another speed up you can do, which is if you assume that the deformation costs only depend on the displacement between parts. And I'm not saying that the two parts should be on top of each other, just that the deformation cost depends on the displacement. Then uh, the the steps that you need to solve in dynamic programming turn out to be uh, exactly uh, characterized by these, these things called min convolutions, which are like convolutions in the min plus semi ring. And in some important special cases, we can solve this problem in linear time, both in the number of parts and in the number of locations for each part. And, and this is pretty impressive because this is as fast as you would do if you simply measure how much each part uh, matches each location in the image and pick the best one individually for each part. So you get the connections between parts for free. Uh, so that's the, the, the main result. So, so first, let me just uh, tell you how the dynamic programming works. So if you have a model, which is a tree structure, in this case a face that has uh, four parts, uh, every tree has a leaf. And the idea is that we'll eliminate one leaf at a time using dynamic programming. So in this case, you have the eye and the nose, they're connected. And since the eye is only connected to the nose, I can solve for the best location for the eye as a function of a location for the nose. So that's the idea of dynamic programming. For every location of the nose, you find the best location for the eye. And that involves minimizing over locations for the eye. Uh, and you just evaluate for each location of the eye, the match cost and the deformation cost. You pick the best. And now you can say that the cost of placing the eye at its best location, you just associate that with placing the nose somewhere. 
And now you can delete the i and solve this problem to find on the smaller graph. Yeah? But you get the same final answer no matter what you choose as the root? Yeah, it doesn't matter. Uh, there, there are issues of ties, like, you know, if you resolve ties differently, but yeah. Doesn't matter. You just, any leaf can be eliminated uh, and you get the same final answer, yeah. Yeah, try to convince uh, the computer vision community of that. And you'll have <laughs> I was just thinking, what if you can't see one of the parts? What if one of the parts is included or just missing somehow? Wouldn't then the start note be important? No, it doesn't matter. It turn, actually, this, this framework is great for occlusions because you're searching over all configurations <coughs> implicitly. So if, there's, if the best configuration involves putting the eye somewhere where there's no evidence for the eye, you'll just put it there. You just want to make sure that the match costs don't get too expensive. You wanna, if the match costs are bounded, then uh, the optimal configuration will hallucinate locations for the parts. Uh, so, right, so you keep removing leaves until you get a single part last. So, if you want to solve this, this step in dynamic programming by brute force, for every location L1, you have to find the best L2, so that leads to a, a quadratic algorithm in the number of locations. But, now let's assume that the deformation costs depend only on the displacement between L1 and L2. And L2. Then now I'll just rewrite the equation. It looks like this. And now, if we look at this equation, replace this min with a sum and that sum with a product, what you have here is the convolution of M2, the match quality for part two, and G, the displacements. And this is the other key idea, that this is, uh, this is like convolution in the min plus semi-ring. Uh, and it turns out that we don't know how to compute con min, min convolutions efficiently like you could with a normal convolution. The FFT doesn't work. But if, if G is convex, then we can compute this in linear time. Uh, so this is, you, it's like a geometric problem. You basically have to compute the lower envelope of convex functions. Uh, and, and the requirement that G is convex is actually, it turns out to be a very natural requirement. Uh, so, so that's what I'll say about this algorithm. Let me just show you the kind of uh, things you can do with this. Uh, so here's a, using a, a model for a motorbike, detecting the model in, in several images. I'm not showing you the model, uh, but just illustrating that this is a model that can handle many kinds of motorbikes, uh, and, and the model has six parts, the, the wheels, the headlights, the front and back of seat, and all the parts are, are well localized in all these example images. So this is very fast. Basically, the runtime is linear in the number of pixels. This runs at frame rate. Uh, and it's taking into account spatial configurations between parts, and it's finding a globally optimal solution. And unfortunately, I didn't put it in my slides, but you, if you include a part, it just hallucinates where the part should be. Uh, but you can do more with this. So here's an example of doing pose estimation. So here the parts are rectangles, and the location for each part specifies a position, orientation, and foreshortening. And the parts are connected in a tree structure, while well, the human body is tree structure, the, the kinematics. Uh, and, and, and this is the best uh, configuration for the object in each of these images. So you see, this is kind of a, you see the background is simple here. So I built this system, and, and, and it requires the background to be simple. But the algorithms don't require the background to be simple. Uh, the algorithms are very general. So I'll just show you this video. So this is not my work. This is work a colleague of mine did using these algorithmic tools we developed to, to track human bodies in video. And the idea is to be able to track human bodies, estimate the pose of human bodies in, in sort of TV quality footage, in this case of baseball. Uh, and in the left, you see the placement, the optimal placement of the object. The tracking is being done here basically by matching in each image independent of what you got the last image. And in the right, it's actually showing you uncertainty. It turns out that these, I showed you one algorithm, but there's another version of the algorithm which is actually somehow able to compute probabilities which model uncertainty. Uh, so in the right, it's just showing you for every pixel, uh, it's estimated probability that it's in the torso or the head and so on. And, and it does a very good job. Uh, of tracking. So this is the, the, the pictorial structure stuff. 
So I'll now move to talk about this uh, other type of deformable models. Yeah. So, but most problems are not trees. Most problems are not trees, uh, but we have certain nice ways to deal with that. So uh, we can basically, even for the human body uh, problem, the true problem is not tree because there, there are certain constraints between the different body parts. And what we do, in fact, is we use the tree to generate hypotheses, good hypotheses. And then you, it, we, we have a way to think about this as an important sampling. You, you, you have this tree to generate. You can imagine looking at all possible good hypotheses according to a tree and then evaluating it by, by looking at more complex models. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah uh, right. The, the tree structure is, a, is an assumption that we need to, to make the algorithms run fast, but there are some ways to get around it. Um, now, pictorial structures assume that you have a number of rigid parts arranged in a deformable configuration. But there are lots of problems where uh, this doesn't really make sense. Like in the case of the corpus callosum, what are the parts? Uh, it's not clear what the parts are. And one thing I've been really interested in is uh, modeling shape. So, so in the case of corpus callosum, or in this case of leaves, so can you recognize a leaf by looking at its shape? Uh, so, so I've been interested in building the formable models for shapes. Uh, and I've worked on a couple of different projects in, in this area. So let me show you. First one, uh, where we use uh, triangulated polygons to, to model the formable shapes. So the idea is that you start with a polygonal template and then you triangulate it. Uh, and now you can model deformations of the object in terms of deformations of triangles. And we say you can kind of imagine that you in, independently deform each triangle in the object to get a deformed version of the object. Uh, and now you have this triangulated polygon, and you can look at the structure of triangulated polygons. And if the polygon has no holes, and when you build a triangulation, if you don't put Steiner vertices, points inside the, the, the polygon, then the dual graph of the triangulated polygon is a tree. And then you can do dynamic programming again. Uh, and the, the blue graph, the, the structure of the, the, the triangulated polygon itself is a two tree. Uh, so here's some examples of, of the system I built. Uh, so basically, we, we look at triangulated polygon models, and then we consider maps that are continuous, taking the model to the image. And these maps are affine when restricted to each triangle. So you think about them as mapping a triangle to a triangle. Uh, and these maps are defined by where they take the vertices of the polygon, because an affine map is defined by the, the image of three points. So, so that gives you a, a, a finite space to look over. And you use the, the, the structure of triangulated polygons to be able to do that quickly. Uh, and, and then you can find, again, globally optimal matches between a, a, a deformable model and an image in these cases. I'm obviously skipping over a lot of details, but I just want to give you an idea of what these look like. Uh, so in this case, uh, every deformation has a cost associated with it, which measures how much deformation is being applied, how much each triangle is being deformed. But also, every deformation aligns the boundary of the model with certain, image, certain parts of the image. So you measure the image gradient there, and you want it to be high. Uh, so you add those two terms together, and you get a, an optimization function. You get a, an objective function that you can optimize. Um, so, so this is uh, one work that I've done with uh, shape uh, matching. And currently, I'm looking at different models for shape. So let me just uh, give you an overview of those models. So I've been interested in building hierarchical models for shapes. Uh, and here's uh, one approach to do it. So suppose you have a curve. What you can do is you can build a, a, a representation of the shape of this curve which is basically a binary tree. And the idea is as follows. If you have a curve that starts at A and goes to a point B, you pick a point C in the middle of this curve somewhere, and you store the location of C relative to the two endpoints. And then you recursively describe the two halves of the curve defined by this midpoint. So you get a binary tree. This is similar to uh, the arc tree or strip tree that people have used in computer graphics. So the key idea is that each node in this, this tree actually 
only store the relative position of a midpoint with respect to two other points. Uh, so the first node stores the location of C relative to A and B. And then the subtree rooted at this node describes the curves that starts at A and ends at C. And the other subtree describes the curve that goes from C to B. So this is like a part-based representation uh, because subtrees describe subcurves. Uh, it's the, the representation is invariant to, to similarity transformations because you're only storing relative positions. But if you, if you tell me where the endpoints go, I can now reconstruct the curve because I know the location of a midpoint with respect to the endpoints and then I can recurse down the tree that way and place the whole thing. And if you think about what's going on in the bottom of this tree, what, if, you, if you're talking about the location of a point relative to two neighboring points, that's like a measure of curvature, local curvature. And if you think about what's going on in nodes near the top of the tree, that's also like a measure of curvature, but of a subsample version of the curve. So you're basically capturing local properties at different resolutions. And one of the key ideas is that uh, you're really capturing global aspects uh, by, by looking at the, the nodes near the top, global aspects of shape. So now you can imagine adding uh, random noise to every relative location in this tree and trying to reconstruct the curve because if you can just reconstruct the curve by recursively going down the tree. And what you see is that if you independently perturb every node in the shape tree and you reconstruct the object, you get an object which is very similar to what you started with, but deformed. But the key point is that the deformations preserve global aspects of shape because exactly there are nodes that capture global aspects of shape. So the square is a good example. So even though you're getting very deformed shapes, uh, the, the, the deformed objects still seem, seem to have four sides that meet at a right angle in some sense. Uh, so this, and you're just adding independent noise to each node. And now I can talk about the problem of matching two shapes, the problem of measuring the similarity between them as basically asking how much noise do I need to add to the shape tree of one object to turn it into the other object. Uh, and you can do that uh, by basically doing dynamic programming over the shape tree. Uh, and, it, and it turns out to be very similar to the CKY parsing algorithm. You're basically parsing one shape using the shape tree of the other. Uh, so, so this is supposed to illustrate that. So if you want to match the subcurve rooted at node W to the subcurve so this is the model to the subcurve of that curve there that goes from P to R. You have to search over a midpoint Q and then for every choice of the midpoint, you, you look at the best match of V to P to Q and the best ma ba match of U to Q to R. And you also measure the difference between the relative position of E with respect to AC and Q with respect to PR. So this is just like the CKY algorithm. Uh, and it gives you a way to compute the best match of one shape tree to a curve and the cost for that match. Uh, and it actually, it's very interesting to think about this as parsing because what you realize is that you can generalize these, these trees uh, very easily to handle more general models. So in particular, what we're looking at currently is models where you have a context-free grammar that generates the structure of a tree, and on top of the context-free grammar, you have a geometric model for position of midpoints with respect to endpoints. So that lets you model, for example, the idea that a dog may or may not have a tail. So the choice of whether to put a tail or not in the dog is the choice of a different production in the grammar. And then after you choose that, you choose the geometry according to this deformation model. And all the algorithms expand. And these algorithms can also be used to match two images, although I won't show you that. But the first thing we did is to say, well, this gives one way of measuring the similarity between two objects. You, you, you start with one object, you build a tree, you, you match it to another curve, and you get a measure of their similarity. And is that a good measure of similarity? Yes? Um, 
On the previous slide, you had the matching of the squares. Right. And I'm wondering when you've got a closed shape like that, it seems like which points you choose must matter a fair amount. Presumably, if you choose the four corners as your four points to start with, then right. you're getting the global shape at sort of a high level. But if you chose sort of funky points in there, wouldn't it not work as well? No, it actually works fine. Uh, it's not, yeah. That's a good question. Uh, whether it's important to pick the, the, the corners early on in the tree or what, uh, but it turns out to not be such a problem. Uh, but the one thing we're looking at now is, suppose I show you a lot of squares, how sh what's the best shape tree to model them jointly? And, and you can think about that as a, as a, a grammar learning problem. In this, uh, and it turns out that, uh, you can apply EM just like you could in a normal context-free grammar. So we, there, there are differences. There are choices that are better than others. But in this case, I did not pick the points carefully. They were just, I, I always pick a midpoint to be more or less, to be exactly halfway with respect to arc length in this example. Maybe the point is if you have a budget on, the, on how fine your discretization is. Then, yes. If you have a budget on how fine your discretization is, then you want to pick the corners because you're going to model this essentially as polygonal in between sample points. But when you move to the grammar framework, it turns out that if you think about this tree here, the, you can, there's a very simple generalization of the model where in the bottom you stick a non-terminal, let's call it L, and then you have a production, L goes to LL. And that lets you model objects with arbitrary number of sample points. And we can parse using these things just as well. <coughs> so that turns out to be uh, a nice way to handle sampling issues. And in fact, the way I like to think about this is that there's a model for a continuous curve. So the grammar has no non-terminals, uh, no terminals, just non-terminals. When you generate a shape at random, you get an infinite tree. And the tree gets cut off by the observation process, like when you generate an image. That's one way to think about it. So this very simple approach to matching shapes, forget grammars, just this very simple, this algorithm that's in this slide, leads to state-of-the-art uh, shape recognition results. So this is one example uh, data set of leaves. Uh, you have 15 species of leaves. You want to recognize a leaf from their outline. Uh, and basically, you, re you, you have some training images. You just store them. And whenever you see a new leaf, you compare to every training image you've seen before, and you classify according to the nearest neighbor, where distance is defined by this measure uh, that I just defined. Uh, and we get very good recognition results, uh, better than, than any other method. Uh, and this is probably the only time I've ever built a vision algorithm that does better than I do. Uh, uh, I, I don't know how much is possible here, but there are some classes of leaves that are, to my eye, indistinguishable, but it turns out to be statistically distinguishable. So let me just now tell you about this other project that uh, I've been working on, uh, and it's motivated by this Pascal challenge for object detection. So this is a challenge where uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, Object recognition challenge, there are 10,000 images. Half of them are for training and half of them are for testing. And there are 20 different objects that are marked in these images. And these are two example images from the data set. So the objects are marked with bounding boxes around them. Uh, and what you'd like to do is to, to give it an image, put bounding boxes around the objects, and label them. Here's a person, here's a car, and so on. Um, and one of the motivating things for me to start working on this project was that I had been working on the formal models for a while, and people agreed that this is a great idea. But in practice, what people were seeing is that much sort of naive methods were doing much better in object recognition tasks. Uh, and part of the problem is, to, to, is that when you're doing something very simple like using a bag of words model or a rigid template, it's very easy to apply a powerful learning technique like SVMs with some complicated kernel. Whereas when you're trying to learn, uh, trying to build mod the formable models, it's, it's harder to, to apply uh, learning methods. 
Uh, so here's some more images in this, in this set. So the motivation to me was really demonstrate that the formable models are not just a good idea, they actually work well in practice. Uh, uh, so the images are quite hard. Uh, and in fact, even though our system does very well compared to other systems, we still do quite badly uh, in many situations. So we're very good at detecting cars. We're very bad at detecting people. Uh, we're very bad at detecting chairs. Uh, so the way the model, so let me just give you an overview of the model. The model is a part-based model like the pictorial structures models, but it, the model is also multi-scale. So here's an example of detecting a person. So we detect, uh, in this case, uh, six parts plus the person as a whole. So there's a global, there's a template for the person as a whole, and that's treated as a part itself. It just models lower resolution aspects of the image. So there are these filters. Every part has a filter that's used to compute the match score of each part at each location. And in, what I'm showing here are basically coefficients of the model that say for every location and orientation, how much you want to find a boundary at that orientation there. So this is the filter for the, the root template, the, the global template for the person. And these are the part filters, so they capture finer resolution edges. And these are deformation models for the part. So for every part, there's a cost of placing it somewhere relative to the root template. And, and this cost is also learned. Uh, and it's parametric, but it, 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 it can represent very interesting shapes. So these are arbitrary quadratic functions, these, these deformation costs. So how do you learn the costs? So we learn them jointly. I'll, I'll, I'll try to show you in a second. Uh, but you can think about the, the, the deformation costs as having two parameters, that uh, four parameters that define a two-dimensional quadratic function and you want to learn those parameters. That's the same as learning coefficients of these filters. So we, we just learn it all jointly. So to understand these filters a little better, let me just show you uh, what we do with an image. So you're given an input image like this bicycle, and you start by uh, partitioning the image into 8 by 8 pixel blocks. And for every block, you compute histogram of gradient orientations. So that tells you for every orientation whether or not there's a boundary or, or it looks like there's a boundary of that orientation in the image. And there's several reasons why that's a good idea. In particular, gradient orientation is invariant to all sorts of illumination changes. And by making these 8 by 8 histograms, we're also insensitive to small deformations. Uh, and so we compute these features. They're called hog features. So this is an image, an input image, and the hog feature representation of that image. For every 8 by 8 block, there's a histogram of orientations. And I'm just showing you the orientations that have high value. And we do this at several resolutions. So you compute this, you subsample the image a little bit, you compute it again, and you get a pyramid. Now, you have this pyramid. And now if you have a filter, a filter is just a, a template with coefficients. And you can now take the dot product of this filter with a subwindow at any level of this pyramid that, that gives you a score for placing that, that filter somewhere. And now if you have a, a, a deformable model like, like the one I was talking about before, that model has a root template, part templates, and, and deformation costs, and an object hypothesis basically places the root filter at one level of the pyramid it places the part filter several levels down to capture higher resolution information. The, the number of levels you go down is fixed to be basically at twice the resolution. And the score of this object hypothesis is the sum of the filter scores plus the deformation scores. So every location for the head has a, has a deformation score because it depends on its displacement with respect to the root template. And it turns out to be very important to have these multi-scale models. And one of the key ideas to be able to learn this thing uh, efficiently is to note that this score can be seen as a dot product. Basically, you concatenate the, if you concatenate the features in the blue window, 
with the features from the yellow window, and then you concatenate in this vector the displacements of each part, and then you take a dot product with a, per, a per, you know, appropriately constructed vector, you get exactly the score of this object hypothesis. Um, but the learning problem we have is we're given images with bounding boxes of where there's a person, for example, and really like to get a model like this. So this is a little bit different than normal learning problems because, first of all, it's semi-supervised uh, because we don't know in advance what the parts of the object should be, where are they in these images, and so on. And the other thing that uh, turns out to be very important is to note that just because this image has a bounding box here does not mean that you need your mo model to fire exactly here. You might want to let it fire a little to the side, a little to the top, and so on. So what we do in practice is um, set up this, basically say that if you have a bounding box in the training set that says here's a person, that defines a range of object hypotheses for which one of those hypotheses should score high. Uh, and, and so basically, the score of a model W on an input X is the max over all placements of all the filters Z allowable, defined in terms of X, of basically the model W dot product with a feature vector that you compute appropriately. Um, but if you look just at the, the inside here, this is just like a linear classifier. Uh, so we can formulate the learning problem uh, by basically generalizing uh, classical ways to do, uh, learn linear classifiers. And we've done that with, with uh, support vector machines, and I'll sort of move quickly here, but the idea is that uh, you have this score function which is not linear, but it's a max over linear things. Uh, and you have some training data which says for a given input whether your model should score high in it or not. And then you can set this up just like a normal support vector machine with a regularization over model parameters and a hinge loss. And the problem is that this is no longer a convex objective function, so you can't find the optimal model using standard techniques. But it turns out that this is what we call semi-convex, if you fix the labels, the placement of the filters in the positive examples, then the objective function is convex, even if you don't fix it on the negative examples. And that leads to a coordinate ascent algorithm that we can uh, crank on to train these models. Yeah? So what's latent here is the location of the object? What's latent is the location of the filters. So I give you windows, I, I give you examples of each of the filters. Uh, and actually, I also, uh, you also don't know what the, how many parts there are in the model and so on. Although we don't do model selection on that. We just say there will be six features, uh, six parts or something like that. Um, let me just show you some of the models we learned with this technique. So these models are learned just from images labeled with bounding boxes. Uh, so there's the bottle model, the car model, sofa, and bicycle. So one thing to note, for example, in the bottle model is that there's a part, the second from the top to bottom, which basically is allowed to move up and down, but not too much left and right. That's what the deformation costs are showing. And we learned those from data simultaneously as we learned the, the, the part models and so on. So these models, they, they have a lot of interesting things in the, in the way that they have very different kinds of uh, deformation costs, like, you know, this deformation cost here versus the bottom one, which is very different um, for every part. Uh, and in the car model, you can kind of see there are three things that look like wheels. And basically what's going on is depending on the pose of the car, two of those will be wheels and one will be a headlight. Uh, uh, so let me show you some example results. Uh, so the first row shows detections of people. The second row, detections of bottles. And the third row, detections of cars. Uh, and the last column are uh, false detections, false positives. Uh, so this one is not so bad. A bus is found as a car, a sheep as a person, uh, right? Uh, and the person's head as a bottle. Uh, 
But in the other cases, uh, it worked perfectly in these images. So there, in that, in that image over there, the second of the first row, you see there's uh, one, two, three, four, five people. Might be hard to see with all the stuff drawn on top. And they're all, all localized correctly. And their bodies, uh, you have this red bounding box, which is the position of the root filter. And you have uh, the heads, they're all localized very well, and so on. You have a person behind a bush in the third image, and it's detected uh, even though they're behind a bush. Uh, this is the hallucination that I was talking about. So the matching problem is exactly solved using the algorithms I showed you in the first part of the talk. Uh, these models are tree structured. They're really star graphs with the root the filter is the center of the star and all these other things hanging off of it. And you have these quadratic deformation costs, which are convex or concave. Turns out we can handle concave things just as well. Um, so all those algorithms are incredibly relevant uh, for this. Here's some more example results of sofas, bicycles, and horses. Uh, so these models are really two-dimensional, but they can capture objects from, viewed from many different viewpoints. You can see in the horse, horse sideways, horse jumping up, horse facing forward, and this is a false positive. Uh, here's a false positive for bicycles. Uh, according to the data set, anyway, uh, and so forth. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it seems like so you're not using any like you know, geometric context. The fact that you know cars are on the ground. Right, right, right. right. So it no. seems like, like you know, is there an easy way to integrate that? There are easy way. There well, there are many things you want to do, of course. Yeah, and and all these techniques about adding context. If you know where the ground plane is, you can know that that's a false detection and so on, and we're not, we're not using any of that. We just wanted to build the simplest model possible that uses the formable models and that beats everyone out there. Uh, <laughs> that's basically the objective. Uh, so, so what are the results? So there are nine systems that competed in this challenge, and out of 20 classes, we, we, this system gets the first place in 10 classes. So we don't get first place in all classes. There's some classes like cats and dogs that we're terrible at. Uh, these models are not good models for cats and dogs. Uh, and I didn't expect them to be. Uh, a good thing is that the, the, the system is very fast, relatively speaking. It's much faster than any of the other systems that compete in the challenge. So it takes about two seconds to evaluate one model and one image. Uh, it takes about three hours to train a model. Some of these other systems take weeks in a cluster to train a model. Um, and let me just show you. Uh, an analysis of what the different aspects of the system are doing. So these are precision recall curves. Uh, and in red, I'm showing the results of using just a rigid template for the object as a whole. So that's just the low resolution template for the, for say, in this case, a person trained using SVMs. This was the state of the art before we did this work. And in blue, I'm showing you what happens if you, again, only use a single rigid template for the model, but you don't take the training data to be correct. Every, each box in the training data, you say, well, I don't have to fire exactly at this box. I can fire a little bit off. And that, so in the end, the detection system is exactly the same. It's the training that changes, and you get a, a significant boost in performance. And then in green, it's the what you get using just parts and no root template. And then in, in cyan, is that what that's called? Maybe that's cyan. Uh, what you get by using a multi-scale model. Now, this precision recall curve shows you how bad we're doing in the person detection. Uh, we do much better in cars. So we get essentially precision close to 1 all the way to recall 0.5 in cars. Uh, but but for person, it's very hard. Uh, and there, there, I mean, there are a million things we can do to improve this. Uh, this is just you know, the, the beginning of it. So I'll just, uh, some, let me just, you know, I guess, summarize, and then uh, we can, you can ask some questions. Uh, I hope I convinced you that these deformable models really are useful in practice. And there's a really good uh, algorithmic questions there, uh, and both in terms of matching these models to images, in terms of learning these models. Uh, 
there are a lot of applications of the formable matching, uh, like, like I just show you the recognizing generic objects like cars and so on, uh, finding the pose of humans, detecting non-rigid objects, uh, medical image analysis and so on. Uh, the, there's a significant challenge of learning the formable models from partially labeled data. Uh, so we can, we started to do that now. Uh, and there's a lot of interesting things to explore now. One of the things we started exploring is building models that have deeper hierarchies. So for example, you can imagine a person model that has my body as a whole, my face as a part, and then eyes and nose and so on. And you can imagine, so my hope is that we can train such a model just from bounding boxes on people, and what we'll get out of it is, for example, a very good face detector out of it. So you can imagine that you can learn about faces and be good at detecting faces just by having bounding boxes around people. And it turns out that a three-level model for people significantly improves performance. There's a lot of interesting work to do in using grammars. Basically, all the models I showed you have fixed structure and then the geometry is variable, but we're moving towards models where the structure itself is variable. Uh, so you can imagine saying that a person can have either open or closed legs and you make a binary distinction between those and then uh, within each you model uh, as a deformation. Or, uh, and, and there's the issue of modeling 3D objects uh, and that's another area that uh, we've been thinking about. How do, all the models I showed you so far are basically two-dimensional. Uh, and you can pretend objects are two-dimensional and run them, but objects are not two-dimensional. So, yeah. Was there a variable scaling parameter or anything like that to deal with the possibility that you might have a close-up or a far-away view of a face or a model or something? Uh, yes. I mean, in the case of the object detection that I was talking about right now, an object hypothesis places each filter in a level of an image pyramid. So you're searching over scale, just like you're searching over translation. Yeah. Uh, what, what's a good uh, technique for recognizing things you couldn't do well on, like cats? And, or, can you do hybrid models or anything like that? I have no idea. Uh, <laughs> uh, that's the truth, and that's part of the challenge. I mean, we, we don't know. How do you represent what cats look like? I have no idea. Uh, I mean, I can tell you that probably material properties are important, and we're not capturing it. So, fur, fur. Uh, so that's important. Now, also, if you look at a silhouette of a cat, you can often recognize it as a cat. So I think shape is important as well, not just material properties. Uh, but we 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 don't know how to build a good cat recognizer, and it's not something. It's not an algorithmic problem. It's it's a it's a modeling problem just as well. Yeah. Hierarchical curves at all robust poles. To poles? Yeah. Uh, so they they can deform. So you can think about poles variation as deforming the curve. Uh, but are they so He's talking about different view classes of the same object having different appearances. Right. So if you look at an object from very different viewpoints, they look completely different. Uh, and one single hierarchical model with a fixed tree will not be. Uh, but you could hope that there would be a grammar that, that can capture all the views compactly. Because even though two views might look very different, Subcurves of two views are going to be very similar because there's not much that can happen in subcurves anyway. Yeah. So the, the deformable curves have this kind of recursive aspect of things like wavelets and so on. How do, how do these relate to, to the Right. Curves, right? So they are related to wavelets. And at first, we didn't know how. But it turns out that the matching problem we're solving is almost the same as comparing wavelet coefficients, hard wavelet coefficients of the derivatives of two curves under reparametrization. So you don't want to just compute wavelet coefficients of one curve and another.
because if there is a little bit of warping, like a little bit of stretching to go from one to the other, wavelets, they don't behave very well with respect to those because they're not homogeneous. But now if you consider allowing yourself to reparametrize one curve and searching over all possible reparametrizations to make the wavelet coefficients as similar as possible, that's basically what we're doing. Although we're not really reparametrizing the curves, we're reparametrizing the wavelet coefficients. Uh, so we're saying, yeah. Yeah. Do you think that your techniques, which seem to be, you know, well adapted to rigid uh, articulated uh, modeling and so forth, would extend in some way to uh, you know, more organic forms, uh, octopi, eels, uh, <laughs> biological images of cells, and so forth? Uh, so I think that the, the formable shape work is. Uh, I think the corpus callosum is an example of a blob-like thing. Uh, and you can model fairly deformable things if you have this sort of long chain of, po of triangles and you deform each triangle a little bit. It's like an octopus. I mean, I, yeah. All right, thanks a lot. Yeah. Okay.